Good morning. I'm Stephanie Gosk in for Joe and Savannah. Right now on Morning News Now, rescued from war. Developing this morning, operations at the American Embassy in Sudan are now suspended after U.S. Special Forces extracted dozens of government personnel and their families from the nation's capital. Now, concern is growing over the thousands of Americans still in Sudan as the fight for control of the country intensifies. I'm disappointed. I'm afraid to losing them in the next hours. I don't know what will happen in Sudan next few hours. We have team coverage this morning of the daring evacuation operation, plus what's being done now to help those who remain. Dissatisfaction. This morning, voters are expressing a bleak outlook on the 2024 election. A new NBC News poll showing they don't want a 2020 rematch between President Biden and former President Trump. We'll tell you why. Plus, how Trump's ongoing legal troubles could impact the election. Vaccine concerns. This morning, researchers are looking into reports of a possible side effect of the COVID vaccine. Thousands of people say they developed a constant ringing in their ears. What we know about those cases, plus how the CDC is responding. And you've got a friend. Feeling lonely? Well, you might want to know you're not alone. A new survey shows adult friendships are on the decline, especially for men. But now a pair of podcasters is on a mission to change that. More on how they're forging friendships and creating community. We begin this morning with the ongoing violence in Sudan, which is in the midst of a bitter power struggle between rival generals. Several countries are now evacuating their citizens from the capital Khartoum as fighting between the army and a paramilitary group shows no signs of slowing down. On Saturday, the U.S. pulled out its embassy staff and diplomatic personnel in an incident-free extraction that involved three transport helicopters taking off from the U.S. base in Djibouti. Secretary of State Antony Blinken supervised the operation, which resulted in fewer than 100 people being evacuated. But U.S. officials say there are currently no plans to get out other Americans still in Sudan. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby has the latest. After days of planning, several nations have begun evacuating their diplomatic staff out of Sudan. But as the violence continues in the capital city, Khartoum, these rescue missions become even more dangerous. The urgent race to evacuate citizens from the growing violence in Sudan's capital city, Khartoum. The French carrying out several evacuation flights successfully, the Italians flying its citizens and those of other European nations to safety. The U.S. carried out their daring rescue operation under cover of darkness. Elite U.S. special operations flew multiple helicopters 800 miles from Djibouti to Sudan, landing on the embassy grounds where they loaded 80 government personnel and their families onto three Chinook helicopters in about an hour. Remarkably, U.S. officials said there were no injuries or complications. These are missions that are inherently risky. Kudos to the Department of Defense for pulling this off so smoothly. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also announced the closing of the U.S. Embassy, saying it was temporary and necessary due to the unacceptable risk to embassy personnel. More than 16,000 Americans are still in Sudan, many of them dual nationals. But with supplies running low, hundreds are hoping to escape their family members outraged. Really, I'm disappointed. I'm afraid to losing them in the next hours. I don't know what will happen in Sudan next few hours. Biden administration officials say they do not expect a larger evacuation of Americans now or even in the coming days. Sunday was the third and final day of a ceasefire meant to celebrate the Muslim holiday Eid al-Fitr. But the truce did not stop the bloodshed. So far, more than 400 have died, 3,000 more injured, according to the World Health Organization. Civilians caught between warring generals, even as neither side shows any signs of backing down. The U.S. military's planning for Sudan continues. Multiple other nations have reached out to the U.S. asking for help in getting their diplomatic personnel out of Sudan. And now U.S. officials say the administration is considering it. Back to you. All right, Courtney, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs for more on the story. Jack, really nice to see you. Let me start with this. 
How surprised are you that this U.S. evacuation unfolded without any complications or incidents? This was not a simple operation, was it? No, very complicated, actually. What made it a bit easier is that all the evacuees could be brought to one spot, and so the evacuation itself, once the helicopters were on the ground, didn't take all that long. It was less than an hour. What made it difficult, however, was the distance between the staging area in Djibouti and Khartoum, which was at the almost extreme limit of the range of the helicopters. That means that these MH-47s and a few MH-60s could get from Djibouti to Khartoum, but couldn't get back without refueling. So undoubtedly, they were refueled uh, by uh, C-130 refueling aircraft mm -hmm. on the way back. Uh, it was a complicated operation in a difficult area, uh, pulled out flawlessly. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. You know, we know other countries are also evacuating their private citizens, but the U.S. says it has no plans to do that for U.S. citizens. Do you, do you think that's a mistake? What kind of risks would people who are there be exposed to? Well, it's extremely risky, obviously, for those who remain behind in Sudan. But to conduct some kind of evacuation for the remaining uh, Americans and du na dual nationality people, and we're talking between 10 and 15,000 or maybe even more uh, people, would be extremely difficult, uh, if not impossible, and put everybody at risk. I'm not surprised, nobody is surprised, that the administration has no plans on executing any kind of uh, rescue operation for the remainder, Stephanie. Is there anything that can be done to support the people who do try to get out? Well, in the past, in situations that are similar to this, when, when people were in one location or several locations that could be identified, uh, airdrops of supplies have, have been affected. Uh, people who were close to borders or who were close to the sea could be evacuated, too. But we're talking about a relatively small number uh, who could be assisted in the coming days when the battle is going to get tougher and tougher. Stephanie. Yeah, it's just such a big country and such a difficult situation. Colonel Jacobs, thank you so much for your time this morning. You're welcome. The 2024 presidential race could begin in earnest this week, with President Biden expected to launch his campaign for re-election as soon as tomorrow. For more, we're joined by NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Mike, nice to see you. What do we know about the president's re-election campaign, and where is he looking to focus his energy? Well, good morning, Stephanie. With this president, I've covered him a long time over multiple campaigns. There's always a little bit of suspense until the words come out of his mouth, but we are <laughs> expecting to hear the president make his candidacy for re-election official, likely in the form of a campaign video uh, that we expect to go up tomorrow morning. Tomorrow is the four-year anniversary of when the president launched his successful 2020 campaign. We then expect to see the president addressing a union group here in Washington. Union voters uh, are really the backbone of the president's political support, and he wants to shore them up in a hurry. And then we expect to really hear the president's pitch uh, focused a lot of what we've been hearing from the president since the State of the Union address, which is about the need to finish the job, to talk about the accomplishments he believes he's been successful at reviving American manufacturing, shoring up the economy, uh, and that he needs four more years to do that. Now, just because he announces his candidacy does not necessarily mean we're going to see him travel the country on a campaign barnstorming tour. You're going to see this president do what presidents typically do when they seek re-election, have that rose garden strategy, rely on all the trappings of the office for most of this year, and then wait until his Republican opponent is clear. Obviously, we expect that might be a former president, Donald Trump, in a rematch, but that's when the campaigning will really gear up next year. Yeah, you know, not everyone's looking forward to this announcement from President Biden. He's facing stiff headwinds. A new NBC News poll set, says 70 percent of all Americans, including 51 percent of Democrats, believe he should not run for a second term. Obviously not the numbers any president wants to see the week of a planned re-election bid announcement. How is the White House responding to that skepticism? Yeah, there are so many numbers to look at in this new poll, but really the magic number in this campaign is 80. That's the president's age. He'll be 82 uh, if he is reelected and sworn in for a second term, obviously the oldest president in American history. This obviously comes up a lot in my conversations with Biden advisors, and they don't deny that age is going to be an issue, but here's how they respond to it. They talk about two things. One is that he brings experience and wisdom to the office. They argue that no other president without his experience would have been able to do the things he's been able to do legislatively uh, with all his accomplishments, but also leading the world 
in a coalition against Vladimir Putin in support of Ukraine. They also make this point, which is that the president is known as being optimistic. He's always got a positive, forward-looking vision, and that's going to be a very real contrast to what we've seen from Republicans, a very dark, pessimistic view of the country. They think that ultimately voters will reward the president's vision. All right, well, we're also learning more about the team that will be supporting the president in his re-election bid, including his 2024 campaign manager. According to two sources familiar with the decision, the president is expected to tap Julie Chavez Rodriguez for the job. What can you tell us about her? Yeah, she's a veteran of the Biden team for the last four years. She served as deputy campaign manager in his 2020 campaign. She's been a senior advisor in the White House as the head of uh, government affairs uh, within the administration. She also served on Kamala Harris's uh, ill-fated 2020 campaign, so she brings experience in both camps. Notably, she's also the granddaughter of the labor leader, Cesar Chavez. Now, it's important to note that even as she will have the title of campaign manager, a lot of the key decisions about Biden's re-election campaign are going to continue to come from inside the West Wing. Uh, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who was Biden's 2020 campaign manager, continuing to call a lot of the shots inside the building, along with Anita Dunn, a senior advisor. And so we're going to continue to see new names pop up as the campaign takes shape, but this will be a dual effort, both inside and outside the West Wing. It's going to be interesting, Mike. Mike Manley, thank you so much. And as President Biden prepares to announce his run for re-election, it looks like Americans aren't happy with the idea of what may be inevitable, a 2024 rematch with former President Donald Trump. According to a new NBC News poll, just 26 percent of Americans believe he should run in 2024, while 70 percent say he should not. And Trump isn't faring much better. Only 35 percent say he should run, while 60 percent say no. NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray joins us now to break all of this down. Mark, according to this latest poll, Biden's job approval rating is also down. What are the reasons behind Democratic primary voters not wanting Biden to run in 2024? Yeah, Stephanie, our pollsters actually asked the Democratic respondents who said that they don't want President Biden to run for re-election and asked them to answer that in a one word or a short phrase. And one word really stands out, Stephanie, and that is uh, Biden being too old. And in a separate question, nearly half of all Americans who ended up saying that they don't want Biden to run in 2024 said his age is a major reason, with another 21 percent saying that it was a minor reason. So that age uh, definitely stands out there, Stephanie. And of course, as you also ended up mentioning, 41 percent of uh, adults approve of President Biden's uh, uh, overall job rating, uh, and you ended up having 54 percent disapproving. That's down from back in January when President Biden's approval rating was at 45 percent. Yeah, those are dark numbers for them. Mark, former President Trump is facing charges in New York over an alleged hush money scheme involving Stormy Daniels. Has that affected his support among voters at all? Yeah, actually, the support among Republicans and Republican primary voters is even stronger, Stephanie. Our poll finds that 68 percent of Republicans say that they believe they should stand behind Donald Trump amid the investigations, amid the, his recent arrest, because he's being unfairly targeted and they must support him. That's compared to 26 percent who end up saying, that, you know what, Republicans might need someone else uh, who won't be distracted uh, in a general election against President Biden. We have running against Trump, potentially, a few Republican candidates who have thrown their hat in the ring. How's that field shaking up, shaping up at this point? Yeah, we had our first trial heat of the very, very early 2024 Republican presidential race, and it shows the former president, Donald Trump, at 46 percent among Republican primary voters. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who, remember, has not officially announced a presidential bid, although we're all expecting him to do so, comes in second at 31 percent, and no one else gets more than 6 percent. And again, Stephanie, it's still very, very early, but when you look at uh, uh, Donald Trump's 46 percent in that trial, he, along with that other number where I said that so many uh, Republican primary voters are standing behind him, uh, given those investigations. And he is, at this juncture, the early uh, uh, front runner on the Republican race. All right, Mark, thank you so much. That new NBC News poll was front and center on Meet the Press this week, with New Hampshire's Republican Governor Chris Sununu stopping by to share his thoughts on the state of the Republican Party heading into the 2024 election cycle. Here's moderator Chuck Todd. 
Well, hello there, Stephanie. This week on Meet the Press, Republican Governor Chris Sununu of New Hampshire joined me to discuss the 2024 Republican primary after our brand new NBC News poll revealed that Donald Trump was the clear front runner for the GOP nomination. Here's what the governor had to say about the current state of the 2024 race. I still don't think he's necessarily going to be the nominee. Look, I think your poll is spot on in, in all these areas, by the way. I think that's, that's actually a great poll, and I hope folks listen to it. I'll say this. Republicans are rallying. They're supporting former President Trump over these uh, indictments, right? And, and there's a lot of support there. Now, does it actually translate into a vote? We, we will see. I mean, most folks don't decide who they're voting for until about three weeks before the election. So there's a lot of politics to play out. There's not even a single debate has been had. Other candidates are going to get in the race. So I just think it's it's so far away and at the end of the day we want a winner right republicans want someone who can win in november of 24 donald trump is a loser he has not just lost once he lost us in uh, our house seats in 2018 he lost everything in 20 we should have 54 u.s senators right now we don't because of his message so donald trump is positioning himself to be a four-time loser uh, in 2024 we need candidates that can win isn't the problem though that a majority of republicans don't believe what you just said that he lost in 2020 because I, it the loser message should work unless you don't believe he lost well it's not just 2020 right we, we got crushed in 2022 we should have 54 u.s senate seats we don't because he is part of that message we lost in 2018 and so it's not just about whether he won or lost in 20 which he did of course so i, know, I understand folks are supporting him they think mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of this stuff with the da is political which i believe it is too by the way it's creating a lot of sympathy he's playing the victim card right that, believe it or not former president trump is now playing the victim card and he's he's uh, making some headway with it but at the end of the day it has to turn into votes you can see my full interview and a lot more at meetthepress.com, including more on our poll. You can also get more Meet the Press here on NBC News Now every single weekday at 4 p.m. Chuck, thanks so much. After months of warnings, Bed Bath & Beyond, which also owns Bye Bye Baby, filed for bankruptcy yesterday. For decades, it was the store with just about everything for your home or your kid's college dorm. But very soon, those stores will likely all be closing. Brett Rose is president and CEO of United National Consumer Suppliers, a wholesale distributor who works with several major companies, including Bed Bath & Beyond. Good morning, Brett. Thanks for joining me. This wasn't really a shock announcement. Bed Bath & Beyond has been warning for months that they were in trouble. So help us understand how the company got here and what Chapter 11 allows them to do. Sure. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me back. It certainly was no surprise to see that article yesterday. When you have a company as big as Bed Bath & Beyond, who sort of failed to change with the times. The ball really started in motion pre-COVID. Then, you know, the retail landscape as we know it changed going in and out of the pandemic. And what happened with Bed Bath is really they started to face more intense competition as consumers were forced to shop strictly online. And they were slow to the game. You have a company that started in the 70s, went public in the 90s, really about the same time Amazon launched. They should have been positioned really key to be a leader when online sales started to take off. And, and they, they really dropped the ball there. So <laughs> Chapter 11 is going to allow them to figure out a way to save their 14,000 employees and the stores they're keeping open. But unfortunately, I think this is just a step. And, you know, I think you've got Chapter 7 or, or others right behind it. Did the pandemic kind of put the last nail in the coffin? Yeah, you know, I should I should probably say I was always been a huge big Bath & Beyond consumer. I was the guy who loved the coupons like everybody else. And I think the pandemic ju did just that because people, you know, one of Bed Bath's original competitive edge was you walked in there, you walked the stores, the way it was sort of modeled, you had the envelope, the coupon in hands. The pandemic stripped that. So what happened was their only sort of kitschy experiential edge when they came back was the coupons. But at that point, consumers were online. Their stores at this point had been poorly managed, poorly displayed. Mm -hmm. They were certainly a victim of the inventory crises that were going on. And when you're looking at, you know, $5 billion in debt and $4 billion in assets, somehow you've got to fill that delta. And they unfortunately did not, which is a shame because I think they could have had they done some different management decisions. You know, we know that Bye Bye Baby, a discount beauty, health, and cosmetics retailer, Harmon, are also owned by Bed Bath & Beyond. Those stores are closing as well. So what do consumers need to know? I mean, is everyone just going to be going back to Amazon? I, you know, I think they're already at Amazon. I do think 
especially whether this goes from chapter 11 to 7, we will see a rebirth of Bye Bye Baby and Harmon. Bed Bath had a division called CTS, which was Christmas Free Shops, which was originally sort of a Northeast Massachusetts chain that started to expand down the East Coast. They sold that off a few years ago. Regardless of what happens, whether Bed Bath emerges stronger, which you know I sort of hope they do, of course, I do think you will see Bye Bye Baby because there's a lot of cash for that, you know, a lot of cachet behind that brand. And Harmon, to some degree, sold off. So I think consumers, there's no shortage in baby goods and there's certainly no shortage of home goods. I think where a Bed Bath & Beyond could have positioned themselves differently and still may if they forced themselves into the off-price retailer. Mm -hmm. They had one step in traditional retail and one step in off-price. They're not quite a home goods. They're not quite a department store. They need to decide who they want to be when they grow up. Just quickly, do you believe yes or no that there is a place for brick and mortar stores? A hundred percent. I think brick and mortar is alive and well. It just needs to be done right. All right, Brett, thank you so much. Thank you. A chilly start to the week for many of us. Let's get a check at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is tracking the cold front and joins us now. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Stephanie. So good to see you. And it is chilly. You need the jackets for so many of us. About 59 million of us are waking up to freeze alerts and walking out the door to freeze alerts this morning. It's all due to a big area of high pressure kind of anchored over the plains. It's going to stay in place over the next several days. It's funneling down that cold Canadian air, even down to portions of the southern plains are well below normal for this time of year. So daytime highs anywhere from 10 to 25 degrees below what is typical for this time of year. And we're going to feel it as we head out today into tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we'll start to moderate a bit. But take a look at some of these temperatures. This morning earlier, we woke up to temperatures below freezing in many spots. We're not going to rebound very, very far in some spots. Minneapolis, just 50, degree, 50 today. That's 12 degrees below what is uh, typical for this time of year. Dallas, 66. Memphis, 66. Washington, D.C., 8 degrees below average for this time of year. Tomorrow, another cold one. Chicago, 50 degrees. In the 40s in Denver, 62. Kansas City, Buffalo, 50 degrees. That's 10 degrees below normal. So we're going to break a few records as well. That's the first big weather story. The second weather, big weather story is a frontal boundary that's kind of draped over Florida. It's going to bring showers and storms throughout the day, especially this afternoon into the evening hours. Some of these storms could be on the strong side. So we're going to look out for winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail an inch or larger and also a brief tornado is possible. That's another story we're going to watch as we go throughout the afternoon to evening hours. And we could see quite a bit of rain too. Florida has received a lot of rain in the past few weeks. We're going to add on to that locally three to six inches, especially where you see the darker colors, the oranges, the reds, the yellows. That's where we're seeing uh, the heaviest rain or expecting the heaviest rain. For the rest of the country, we're looking at wet weather in the Pacific Northwest. Once again, we're looking at higher elevation snow, lower elevation rain. Plenty of sunshine in the southwest, in the middle of the country. We're looking at the chance for a rain developing over the southern plains. That's going to start tonight, and then we're going to see the Tuesday, Wednesday. We're going to see some flooding conditions possible throughout the next days there. Below average temperatures continuing today, tomorrow, Wednesday. And then when you look at the Great Lakes, we're looking at some blue there. That's indicating the chance for some snow showers mixing in. Really dreary throughout northern parts of New England as well. Wednesday, this is what we're going to watch. Severe storms in the southern plains. Could see some really gusty storms, some tornadoes as well. That's that's one story. This rain's going to extend into portions of the southeast, the Gulf Coast, and we could see some heavy rain there as well. Friday, we're going to uh, build the heat in the west. That's going to be a big difference. Then as we go across the country, we're going to start to moderate those temperatures. Sunny and mild in the southern plains, lots of rain throughout the northern plains to the upper mid Midwest. Also looking at the northeast into portions of the southeast, more rain there as well. Stephanie? All right, Michelle, thank you very much. Oh, sure. Coming up on Morning News Now, uncertainty over the future of abortion rights in America, even after a Supreme Court ruling to keep a commonly used abortion drug on the shelves. Why lawmakers say the fight is far from over. And new information about what could be the biggest heist in Canada's history, how $15 million worth of gold and other valuables just vanished from Toronto's Pearson Airport. We'll be right back. We're back with the latest on the battle over abortion rights. On Friday, the Supreme Court upheld the Justice Department's appeal to freeze a Texas ruling that would roll back FDA approval of Mifepristone. Bottom line, this means the pill remains available to people living in states where it is legal. Two of the nine justices publicly dissented from the ruling, Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas. Justice Alito was the only justice to write an opinion on his decision. Alito claimed the Biden administration would not follow the court's order had it gone against the Justice Department. 
The White House has yet to respond to those claims, but Senate leader Chuck Schumer did speak out following the court's ruling, saying the fight for abortion access is far from over. This decision was a temporary victory. This is hardly the end of our fight to protect a woman's health care and a woman's right to choose. Make no mistake about it, the hard right anti-choice MAGA wing in this country will keep working and working and working to take away all women's rights. But we will fight it and fight it and fight it. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to talk about this ruling. It isn't just the name of this pill, Mifeprestone, that's difficult to say. This is a complicated story. What happens now? Last week, describing the procedural status of this case would have been really difficult, but today it is now much easier because I don't have to explain what the district court did and how the Fifth Circuit held it up in part, but not in other ways. Now the Supreme Court's made it very easy. Basically, we've gotten into a time machine. We've gone back about two or three weeks. Everything is the same as it was before the district court in Texas ever got involved. That's because the Supreme Court has issued what's called a stay. It has hit a pause button on the district court in Texas's ruling. So everything remains the same, the status quo ante, before uh, the Texas district court ever got involved. So Mifepristone is as available as it was a month ago. But it has shaken certainty for people, and people feel a little bit, after all of this news coverage, like they don't know what's going to happen in the future. D does this have a chance of potentially ending back on, on, the, on the steps of the Supreme Court? Yes, they should feel uncertain, and maybe I should have been a little clearer in that, as we sit here today, procedurally, everything's on hold, but this is a case that is moving very quickly, and I can ex we can all expect the Supreme Court to issue an opinion, or when the Fifth Circuit finally briefs it, uh, the Fifth Circuit will issue a decision. It will surely be appealed up to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court may hear it, but it may not. My prediction is they may decline to decide it on the merits because they may decide that what the litigants don't have what's called standing. In other words, the doctors and other folks who oppose the abortion pill uh, simply don't have a concrete enough interest in the outcome to even be in court. Stephanie, courts yeah. love throwing cases out on standing because, frankly, it means they don't have to do any work. If they say, yeah. hey, you're not allowed to be here in court, we don't have to write a 100-page opinion. We just say, hey, you don't, you're not supposed to be here in court because you don't have an interest in the outcome. And then we get back in that time machine, right, and go back to Exactly back, right. We get in the, the same VA. time machine that has gotten us here today. Obviously, this is an, an enormous political issue. You had former Vice President Mike Pence speaking out over the weekend, um, calling on local officials to take action against abortion in general. Let's listen to what he had to say. I think we have an opportunity to advance the sanctity of life, move it ever closer to the center of American law. And I think people should look to their state houses to make that change. But I think looking to the Congress of the United States, uh, creating a, a, a minimum protection, 15 weeks, that is supported by some 70 percent of the American public uh, at the federal level. I, I think these are all ideas that ought to be a part and parcel of the debate. Is this shaping up, and he sort of alluded to it there, this kind of state and federal government battle? What makes this case a paradox is that Dobbs originally, the central theme of Dobbs, was taking abortion out of the hands of the courts and giving it back to state legislatures. And that's the place we are now. A state can prohibit abortion right up until the moment of birth, uh, or it can, excuse me, they can prohibit abortion outright or permit abortion right up until the moment of birth. And we're seeing that already. But this decision is really more about federal courts' oversight of, say, FDA approval, which in a sense runs counter to the entire theme of Dobbs, which is abortion should be left to the states. Well, if that's so, now you have a federal district court judge with no apparent training in medicine or was not elected, was appointed, making a decision on an abortion pill that affects the entire nation. In spirit, it runs contra to the entire idea behind Dobbs. Very, very quickly, if Congress were to pass a federal law, does that trump all of the state laws? It does, and that's the way even the conservative justices on the court would see this uh, as working properly. They would prefer, at least in theory, that the legislatures address this issue, whether it's Congress or state legislatures, rather than nine unelected justices. All right. Danny Savalas, thank you so much for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Time now for some international headlines. Authorities in Kenya have exhumed dozens of bodies in what's believed to be part of a starvation cult. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us now with that and more. Good morning, Ali. It's so nice to see you.
Good morning, Stephanie. Great to see you. That's right. Police in Kenya have exhumed the bodies of at least 47 people thought to be followers of a cult who believed they would go to heaven if they starved themselves to death. The leader of the church, Paul McKenzie, has been arrested following a tip-off that suggested the existence of at least 31 shallow graves. The country's interior minister says the entire 800-acre forest has been sealed off and declared a crime scene. Australia has unveiled a massive defense spending bill in its most radical shakeup since World War II, focusing on long-range capabilities and domestically produced munitions. The review compiled by the Australian government considers China an increasingly muscular threat and noted that the United States, Australia's biggest defense ally, is no longer the unipolar leader of the Indo-Pacific. And finally, with King Charles's coronation coming up, some people might fancy being a monarch on their own kingdom. And for just under $200,000, you could own your own private island off the coast of Scotland with no inhabitants, set on 25 acres of lush green grass stretching out all the way to the sea. The nearest town is six miles away and the closest train station is over an hour's drive. So not ideal for a commuter. And those are your international headlines, Stephanie. You know, Ali, living in the belly of Manhattan, that actually sounds kind of appealing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very appealing. <laughs> in other international news, it could be the biggest heist in Canada's history. Valuables worth $15 million have vanished from a Toronto airport. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch has the story. To the north, Canadian authorities are trying to solve a multi-million dollar mystery. Police say after a plane landed in Toronto Monday, cargo was moved to a holding facility before someone took off with a high-value container. It did contain gold, but was not exclusive to gold and contained other items of monetary value. In all, police say the cargo is worth roughly 15 million in U.S. dollars, but they aren't sharing much else. There may be some tactical or strategic advantage for them for not disclosing, so they're not tipping their hand to the bad guys and where the shipment uh, might be today. John Pistol is a former deputy FBI director and a former TSA administrator. He has many unanswered questions. Was it an inside job and what evidence is there of whoever committed the, the heist, if you will? Uh, what type of access control system do they go through? Do they have a, a, a badge? In a statement, the Greater Toronto Airport's Authority emphasizing last week thieves accessed the public side of a warehouse outside of our primary security line. This did not involve access to Toronto Pearson itself and did not pose a threat to passengers. The alleged airport theft evokes memories of New York's 1978 Lufthansa heist, becoming the stuff of Hollywood legend in Goodfellas. Nobody knows for sure just how much was taken in the daring pre-dawn raid at the Lufthansa cargo terminal at Kennedy Airport. Canada has its own history of high-profile heists. In 2012, thieves snatched millions of dollars worth of maple syrup, according to the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Police believe this latest theft was an isolated incident. Its explanation is up in the air. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News. Coming up, new concerns about a possible side effect of the COVID vaccine. After thousands of people report a high-pitched ringing in their ears, when we come back, what the CDC is saying about those cases. And an unexpected light display at Disneyland. After a fire broke out during a popular show, we'll tell you what happened after the break. Disney is suspending some pyrotechnic shows at all of its properties after a fire broke out in the middle of one of Disneyland's iconic performances Saturday night. NBC News correspondent Erin McLaughlin has more. To the House of the Mouse, a shocking end to one of Disneyland's most popular shows. As Mickey battled the dragon, the fire-breathing prop engulfed in flames. Poor dragon. Didn't make it. It's pretty bad. And nearby attractions evacuated. During the final showing, a phantasmic Saturday evening. The fire even visible from the park's Splash Mountain. Park goer Tim Terensic was there. Show was going fantastic. Just about 5 till 11, you know, the dragon head caught on fire. 
And my sister and I, we kind of, we thought it was part of the show. According to Anaheim Fire and Rescue, the fire was quickly extinguished. While no guests or firefighters were injured, rescuers say several Disney cast members were treated for smoke inhalation at the scene. Disneyland releasing a statement saying they're temporarily suspending similar fire effects at select shows globally out of an abundance of caution while an investigation is underway. So did Mickey win in the end? In the end, I believe Mickey did win. Yeah, and I did see <laughs> Mickey later in the night. So Mickey did, you know, he did make it through the fire as well. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. All right, Aaron, thank you. Thousands of people say they've developed tinnitus, which is a high pitch ringing in their ears after receiving their first dose of the COVID vaccine. NBC News medical con contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now to help us understand the possible connection. Good morning, Dr. Azar. So how do people make this connection and what are the theories behind this possible link? Yeah, Steph, well, that's that's the challenge that the CDC has right now. You know, I see a lot of patients in the office. I'm sure any practicing physician out there has seen patients come in a couple of weeks after their first COVID shot with a new symptom and perhaps even a new diagnosis of something. And it's always tempting um, to want to conclude that there's a cause and effect there. But again, what the challenge for the CDC is, is to take these cases and say, could they actually have happened by chance or are they truly related to the vaccine? A number of studies have been performed. They're all retrospective. They're not big enough to draw a firm conclusion about cause and effect. The theories behind why this is happening, Steph, well, there are many. One is that there is an inflammatory reaction to the vaccine um, and that might have, you know, targeted something in the ear. Um, you know, I, I would also mention, remember, that COVID also caused uh, problems with taste and smell. So we know that the central nervous system is not immune from the effect of either the virus or the vaccine. But suffice it to say, we just don't know exactly why that would happen, but there certainly is some biological plausibility there. Uh, you know, finally, since, since there is no real test for tinnitus, if someone is suffering, is there a cure or a way to at least treat the symptoms? I mean, it sounds awful, <laughs> quite literally. It is. It is. Um, you know, anyone who suffered from tinnitus would, would tell you that, you know, at times it can be an absolutely devastating symptom and people absolutely can get very, very depressed and anxious from it. I would also note before even mentioning treatment is that there are so many other causes of tinnitus that are unrelated to the vaccine, age related, hypertension, many medications can cause it. So again, trying to draw that, you know, line between uh, exposure and symptom is very, very difficult. In terms of treatment, Dr. Doctors have used anything from steroids, different types of medications. One thing that is apparently very, very helpful is different kinds of auditory training, um, sound training. The, a lot of patients will say that the symptoms are worse at night when they're trying to sleep. So using something that can give them a white noise in the background can help. Um, but again, you know, for some folks, it's a bother for other folks. It can be quite, quite devastating. And so, you know, anyone who is an ENT knows how, how challenging and difficult this is to treat. Um, and it's something that, you know, a lot of research and, and funding cer should certainly be devoted to. All right. Well, thanks for those great suggestions and important context. Dr. Azar, thank you so much. Coming up, water could be the future of clean fuel in America how researchers are using it as a carbon-free source of power. You're watching Morning News Now. We're back with the race to find cleaner and more sustainable energy sources. Researchers are now looking at how we can take water and turn it into a fuel that doesn't produce any carbon emissions. NBC News correspondent Jake Ward explains. Let's go back to science class. Water is made up of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Got it? Okay, but what happens when you separate them? Well, you actually get an alternative carbon-free fuel source. Think of this as the equivalent of sticking a tube down in the ground to get oil. At the Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL in Colorado, Keith Whipke spearheads hydrogen research. This is where you make the hydrogen. Because you're turning electricity into oxygen and hydrogen, and then from there, hydrogen would wind up going on to power something. Exactly. Right. And it could be stored, transported, liquefied, and used later. Right now, it's about two to four times more expensive to create hydrogen using only renewable energy, according to the Department of Energy. That is called green or clean hydrogen. The Biden administration is betting big on green hydrogen. 
investing billions of dollars in tax incentives and research and development. All in all, it's part of efforts they say to, one, bring down the price of hydrogen, and two, reach its ambitious goal of getting our nation to be net zero emissions by 2050. A recent blueprint released by the administration shows green hydrogen is a priority for larger vehicles, including planes, ships, ferries, and large trucks, which is exactly what they're developing at NREL. So, so this is the fueling station. The black tanks behind it are the truck. Exactly. And then over here is, what, the big tank is, in the ground. So they're what allow us to move the hydrogen into the truck really quickly. And are we at the point scientifically where you can put all of this away at a filling station such that I could be walking across it to go buy cigarettes and a Coke while my truck fills with hydrogen? Not yet. <laughs> so right now, most hydrogen tanks are stored above ground. You can't bury them yet? N not yet. Companies too are leaning into hydrogen on the ground and in the skies. In March, aviation company Universal Hydrogen successfully flew a 40-passenger regional jet using one regular engine and one engine that runs using hydrogen. In Brooklyn, Air Company uses green hydrogen to power planes by combining it with carbon dioxide it captures to create actual jet fuel. But this is not a quick fix. It's one thing to use hydrogen to fuel a small passenger vehicle like this, but it's another thing to do it at scale and only using renewable energy. Yeah, so there's all kinds of end uses of applications that make sense then. You can make green steel, green ammonia, uh, you can um, make power for uh, small communities or even the power grid. Mm. So it low cost, clean hydrogen really opens up all kinds of opportunities. No pun intended here. Are we there yet? No, but the future of green hydrogen seems like less of a pledge and more like a promise. Jake Ward, NBC News, Denver, Colorado. Pretty cool stuff. Time now for some financial headlines. Jeff Shell has stepped down from his role as NBC Universal CEO. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us now with that and other news. Good morning, Silvana. Good morning. That's right. So Comcast, owner of NBC Universal, which is the parent company of NBC News, announced that the change is effective immediately. Shell's departure comes after an investigation into inappropriate conduct. Shell said in a statement that he had an inappropriate relationship with a woman in the company. Several attempts have been made to reach Comcast, NBCU, and Shell, but so far, no response. His successor has not been announced. And Hauser Bush is shaking up things with its marketing leadership. Reports say a Bud Light marketing executive is taking a leave of absence after overseeing a partnership between the company and a transgender influencer drawing cries for boycotts. Alyssa Heinerscheid will be replaced by Todd Allen, most recently global vice president of Budweiser. Critics have been angry at Bud Light since an April 1st video posted by widely followed influencer Dylan Mulvaney showed her cracking open a can of Bud Light. Tech giant Snap is now making its AI chatbot available to all users. The new feature powered by OpenAI's ChatGPT rolled out to Snapchat Plus subscribers back in February. The company suggests the feature could be used to do things like suggest birthday gift ideas, plan a hiking trip, suggest dinner recipes, or write a poem for a friend, among other things. So technology takes over, right? <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Thank you, Silvana. You got it. We appreciate it. All right. Coming up, bringing back brotherhood. More adult men are reporting a decline in their friendships. Now a pair of podcasters is working to fix that. We'll explain how next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Coachella may be over, but fans are still talking about a surprise performance. From Zendaya, the star of HBO's Euphoria, joined singer Labyrinth to perform two songs written for the hit TV series. It was the actor's first live performance she started as a musician in seven years and the reaction was so loud viewers from home said on social media they could barely hear the singer perform and recent studies cited by the cdc have found loneliness carries with it physical risks risks comparable to smoking obesity and a lack of physical activity the problem is particularly bad for men now a pair of friends is shining a light on the problem through a popular podcast. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz has more. Matt Ritter and Aaron Cairo call themselves champions of yeah. friendship. Hey! Hey! 
friends for over 35 years, the two along with seven others gather every fall over a steak dinner and take a vote. Who had the best year? And the winner is crowned man of the year and gets a big old trophy. What do people think when you tell them about the trophy? I'd say their first reaction is, I wish I had something like that. It's a physical manifestation of friendship ensconced in silver and wood. We always say it's not really about the physical trophy. It's just about something bringing us together 365 days a year. But theirs is an unusual connection. For years, adult friendships have been on the decline, resulting in a so-called friendship recession. And while women haven't completely escaped the trend, the problem seems to be hitting adult men particularly hard. According to a recent survey, 15% of American men say they have no close friends, and 50% say they have three or fewer friends outside of family members. Guys have been taught to prioritize career and family, and then they get to our age, and they're like, oh, wait, I haven't talked to my friends in 10 years, and the wives are like, get out of the house. That's why K. Rowe and Ritter started the Man of the Year podcast. Welcome to Man of the Year. Using their own experiences to help others make and keep friends. I think we've forgotten how much we need that human connection, especially in the past years of the pandemic. We need that human connection as much as we need, you know, money and exercise and everything else. Friendship, as it turns out, can be good for your health, with a Harvard study showing loneliness can be as bad for you as smoking or excessive alcohol use. The same study found close relationships keep people happy and have a larger effect on mood over time. More than money or financial success, and if you're looking to make new friends, step outside. Oh! We tell people to find your third place, which is your home is your first place, work is second place, third place is any place that people socialize besides those. So place of worship, bar, top golf. In the spring, when the weather gets nice, that's what we call friendship cuffing season. There's a lot more activities, things to do. You want to go out and be social. So you need friends to go do that with. Hey, Rowan Ritter saying the thing to remember? Be the ball. Oh! Be the friend. Well, we always say be the friend as opposed to waiting for someone else to be a friend to you. I got these tickets, this is where I'm going, and this is what we're happening. The best equation for a friendship is simple. Two words. Showing, showing up. up. Yeah, you just gotta show up for your friends on the good times, the birthdays, the bad times, the illnesses. It's actually not that complicated or yeah. difficult. We wanna just help you a little bit. You just need to do a tiny bit more. The effort is low and the rewards are super high. Gotti Schwartz, Los Angeles. I love you, buddy. Yeah, I love you too. Oh. What a great message. And finally this hour, the vinyl revival. For the past three years, traditional EPs and LPs are outselling CDs. That's thanks in part to an annual event called Record Store Day. Here's a look at this year's event. At a time when music from any era and every genre lives invisibly in the cloud, Record Store Day is dedicated to music that can actually be held in your hands and to the independent stores that never stop selling it. It's the one day that we are guaranteed to have a line outside and people super excited to buy vinyl releases. Record sales are on the rise for the last 16 years, up 17% in 2022. Like we've seen vinyl totally almost decimate that we thought we were going to close. Rock and Soul Record Store has been in Midtown Manhattan for 50 years. How would you describe the future today for a record store? Super exciting. Like, we're really excited. Record Store Day gets bigger every year. Musicians fuel the hype with special releases, limited editions that sell out fast and can only be bought in the store. Last year, the big record was Taylor Swift. They started lining up 24 hours before. Wow. So they really wanted that Taylor Swift. And this year, it's also Taylor Swift. And when I felt like I was an old guard again. But there is a lot more. Billy Joel, one. Grateful Dead, Stevie Nicks. The best part about Record Store Day is that there is something for everyone, every taste, every generation, including me. It's the 40th anniversary of Violent Femmes' debut album, Blister in the sun like you've never heard it before. Ah, oh, and without skipping a beat. Come. Oh, it's awesome. come on. <laughs> ah, right back to high school. <laughs> so get offline, get off the couch, and go to the record store.
In addition to that Taylor Swift album, 300 other new vinyls were released on Record Store Day. None of those titles were sold online, so if you wanted first dibs, you actually had to get off the couch and go to your local record store. So that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Gosk. Joe and Savannah are on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, rescue mission. Dozens of U.S. Embassy officials are out of Sudan this morning as fighting between two rival generals intensifies in the country. But many U.S. citizens remain caught in the crossfire. We have the latest on the conflict and why the U.S. has no plans of evacuating the nearly 16,000 Americans still in the country. Heating up, the 2024 presidential race is expected to take a new turn this week with President Biden gearing up to launch his re-election campaign. But a new NBC News poll shows Americans are not enthusiastic about a potential second term. We'll show you what Americans also think about another matchup between Biden and former President Trump. Trouble in the skies. Investigations are underway this morning after two serious incidents on airplanes. One, a bird strike on an American Airlines flight yesterday, causing the engine to catch fire. And another engine fire on a plane from the same airline disrupted passengers' plans in North Carolina. We have the latest on those incidents and what the airline is saying this morning. Also this morning, under the sea, a retired Navy officer is hoping to break a world record living underwater for 100 days. He'll join us from 30 feet below the surface with more on what his experiment is about and why he hopes to emerge a, quote, superhuman at the end of it. We begin this hour with the situation in Sudan, where hundreds of people have been killed in the ongoing fighting between the army and a rival paramilitary group. Over the weekend, several countries, including the United States, began evacuating their citizens. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest. The situation in Sudan continues to get more dangerous. At least 400 people have been killed, perhaps many more, as fighting now enters its second week. And this weekend, the United States military carried out a rescue operation to the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum. And now countries around the world are struggling to get their personnel out. After ceasefires collapsed, Sudan's capital Khartoum this morning is an open war zone. There's fighting in the streets and at the airport, which remains closed. There's no power or running water. Phone and internet service are largely down. It's a nightmare scenario as nations around the world struggle to evacuate personnel. France, Italy, Germany, Spain, and others carrying out successful flights, bringing out their citizens and some Americans. This weekend, the United States launched a rescue mission to the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum, which is now closed. U.S. Special Operations flying 800 miles from Djibouti to Sudan, landing just after midnight Sunday on the embassy grounds, where three Chinook helicopters evacuated 80 government personnel and their families. It took around an hour. There were no reports of injuries or incidents. But there are still roughly 16,000 American citizens in Sudan, many dual nationals. They're sheltering in place. For now, there are no plans for a mass rescue. Lakshmi Parthasarati, an American travel writer, was visiting Sudan and is stuck. She managed to send us this video this morning. The city is so tense right now. A lot of people are fleeing left and right. I can see the cars outside. And I'm actually making arrangements to try and get out as well to an area outside of the city that is safer. I have no power, running water. And the most difficult thing is that there's been internet blackouts. So I'm not feeling too great about the help that I've received from the embassy at the moment. So I am just preparing to go it alone and figure out how I can get myself to safety. The fighting is over power. Two of Sudan's top generals who took over in a coup and promised to transition to civilian rule are now battling among themselves for control of the country rich in oil and gold. There's a risk of state collapse and a return to civil war. 
Sudan was already in a very weak position because of years of political instability and civil war. And this latest flare-up in violence is pushing people over the edge. There are already reports of food shortages in Khartoum, and people are running out of cash. Mm. Bleak situation. Richard, thank you so much. Let's turn now to the emerging 2024 presidential race. And President Biden could announce his re-election bid this week. But our latest NBC News poll shows Americans are not enthusiastic about a potential rematch between the current president and the former president, Donald Trump. NBC News White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the latest. Peter, so nice to see you. Good morning. Steph, nice to see you this Monday morning. President Biden's re-election announcement, multiple sources tell us, could come as early as tomorrow. But as you noted, our new NBC News poll shows that most Americans are dissatisfied with what seems increasingly inevitable here, a 2024 rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. As President Biden prepares to launch his re-election bid, our new NBC News poll shows 70 percent of Americans say the president should not seek another term, including 51 percent of Democrats. Nearly half of those who say President Biden should not run cite his age as a major reason why. At 80, he's already the oldest president ever to serve. Still, allies are downplaying concerns about the president's age. He is an active president who is meeting the challenges of America every day. But he's not the only one facing headwinds. Six in ten Americans, including a third of Republicans, say former President Donald Trump should not run again either. But his recent indictment in New York and other looming criminal investigations have only strengthened his position among Republicans. Now 68 percent say they back him to be their nominee. Support for one of Mr. Trump's potential rivals, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, has eroded in recent months. DeSantis has refrained from attacking the former president directly, but just this weekend delivered this veiled swipe. Republicans need to shake the culture of losing that has developed in recent years. One critical issue certain to have an impact on the race, abortion rights. Even after the Supreme Court for now preserved access to the nation's most common abortion medication, Mifepristone. Over the weekend, former President Trump with a video speech at an event in Iowa taking credit for overturning Roe v. Wade. Those justices delivered a landmark victory for protecting innocent life. One of several potential 2024 candidates courting social conservatives there, his former vice president, Mike Pence, who supports a national abortion ban, criticizing his potential rival. I don't agree with the former president who says this is a state's only issue. But our poll found nearly 60 percent of Americans say abortion should be legal nationwide. And some more moderate Republicans are worried the issue is already costing the GOP at the ballot box. As for President Biden's planned announcement, NBC News has learned the president recorded parts of his announcement video last week at his home in Delaware. And another sign that he's gearing up, the president is planning to name Julie Chavez Rodriguez as his 2024 re-election campaign manager. Chavez Rodriguez is a senior advisor to the president here right now and a granddaughter of the late labor leader, Cesar Chavez. Steph. All right, Peter. Thank you very much. And in business news, it looks like Bed Bath & Beyond will soon be closing its doors for good. The company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection yesterday. It's the latest hurdle on a rocky road of setbacks for the business in recent years. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung joins us now with more on this. Brian, nice to see you. How did this happen? I mean, this was a huge store in the day. And how did it just implode? Yeah, well, I mean, this is a, a giant network of stores that everyone's familiar with that effectively will be closing. The announcement coming yesterday from the company that they're filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, that means that the liquidation will start. There will be sales. They're going to try to auction off not only the Bed Bath & Beyond, which they have 360 locations, but uh, also includes Bye Bye Baby, which is also a big part of their business as well. They're going to try to see if they can sell it to anyone else. But in the interim, these stores are going to close. They tried some last-minute efforts to do some fundraising, but it didn't work out, which is the reason why this iconic brand is going to start to shutter to Stephanie. So people 
people, you just mentioned those sales, for people who want to take advantage of them, is that something you can do online or do you have to like, get to the store to take advantage of it? Yeah, well, they do have an online presence, but you know, in stores where you might find the deals and you're going to want to move quick because the deadline for all of this for, you know, those like, do you know those iconic 20% off coupons that we yes. all get in the mail? Yeah. yeah. So you can only use those today and tomorrow because Wednesday, they're no longer going to honor those coupons. The reason being, they're going to start heavily discounting their merchandise inside the store. So if you don't get to a physical store by Wednesday, it's possible that some of that stuff could be gone, especially once those sales begin. And by the way, for those that have uh, merchandise credits, you can only use those up to May 15th, again, as they start to liquidate those stores. What does this say about brick and mortar stores? I yeah. mean, do they have a future in our economy? Well, I mean, you think about the other brands that have gone under, right? Toys R Us was one that was once ubiquitous around this country. Yeah. That went under. Uh, Sears also went under. And a number of other retailers have filed for bankruptcy, although they've been able to hobble along like JCPenney, like J. Crew. But what it tells you is that the brick and mortar store is just no longer as viable in, in an era where e-commerce is really the, you know, the thing. You could just go online, hit a few buttons, and get something shipped to your, to your front door. But also, it, it speaks to the prevalence of big box retailers. It doesn't change the fact that if you need something in a pinch, you still have to get to the physical store, but people want to do a one-stop shop situation. Go to a Target, go to a Walmart if you need an extra bath towel, because guess what? Oh, you need that extra can of, of tomatoes or something like that that uh, you can get at that one place. So, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond needs kind of specialized retailers the sun is really setting on that model. Yeah, you really got to give people a reason to go to the store. Exactly. Right? All right, Brian Chung, thank you very much. Turning out in two separate serious but non-life-threatening aircraft incidents in recent days. On Sunday, an apparent bird strike caused an American Airlines engine to catch fire, forcing the plane to safely return to the ground in Columbus. Meanwhile, an investigation is underway in Charlotte for a possible plane engine fire on the runway. No one was hurt in either incident. NBC News aviation correspondent Tom Costello joins us from Reagan National Airport. Good morning, Tom. No one wants to see an engine on fire in the middle of the air, Tom. No, that's right. That's absolutely right. Hi, Steph. Good to see you. Listen, the bottom line here is that bird strikes are not unusual. But birds taking out an engine, that is a bit more unusual. And this really underscores that these pilots, these crews, did everything right to get their planes back down on the ground. It also underscores the fact that planes are supposed to and can fly on one engine. In Columbus, Ohio, on Sunday, some anxious minutes during takeoff. We, uh lost the number two engine on the bird strike with high vibration. An engine on an American Airlines flight headed for Phoenix caught fire mere moments after taking off, apparently after striking a flock of Canada geese. Everybody started panicking and freaking out. Flight attendants prepared the cabin for an emergency landing. Marnie Kalistat took this video from her seat. It was truly frightening. I didn't think I was going to make it. Also on board, Charles and Felicia Meadows just beginning their honeymoon trip. We could just smell like burning. The Boeing 737 safely returned to the Columbus airport. In a statement, American called the incident a mechanical issue. The FAA reports strikes against all types of wildlife are increasing in the U.S. More than 15,000 reported across 708 airports in 2021 alone. Large bird populations are increasing, so the industry is constantly grappling with this. Bird strikes became a top safety priority after 2009's Miracle on the Hudson, where Captain Sully Sullenberger expertly landed his plane on the river after losing both engines to a flock of geese. Everyone survived. Experience can literally make the difference between success and failure, life and death. Last Thursday, another possible engine fire, this one on the runway just before takeoff in Charlotte. Passengers safely deplaned back at the gate, and the exact cause is still under investigation. But aviation experts stress these two unrelated incidents should not worry travelers. The majority of your commercial flights have two or more engines, and when you think of the, the few, relatively few failures, it's an amazingly safe system. Yeah, you know, we talk about bird strike and wildlife strike, but it's not just birds. It's deer on the runway. In Florida, it's alligators on the runway. It's skunks, for example. So there's a lot of wildlife, but as it relates to birds, airports have been firing off cannons. They've been using nets. They've been even putting out chaser dogs to scare birds away out of the area because they can pose a serious risk to, a, to an engine. Steph?
Yeah, Tom, they, those passengers needed you on the plane to tell them, one engine's okay, you're going to be fine. <laughs> that's right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, Tom Costello, thank you so much. It's a chilly and rainy week ahead. Let's get a check at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now with your forecast. Good morning, Michelle. I needed a coat this morning when I left the house. Me too. I'm like, I don't want to take this back out. I kind of lingered in my car a little bit longer with that heat going. It was <laughs> chilly this morning. Actually, over 50 million people under freeze alerts. That's going to last into tomorrow morning because we saw temperatures below freezing this morning. And we're going to see temperatures this afternoon anywhere from 10 to 25 degrees below what is typical for this time of year. Unfortunately, we're going to see it today, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday before we start that gradual warm up. We were a little spoiled by those. 70s and 80s for most of us. This is what it looks like for today. That big story being the freeze alerts in place, that really chilly air. It's that area of high pressure that's bringing down that cold Canadian air. But we're also watching chances for some snow in spots because it is cold enough for snow. That is in portions of the Great Lakes. We could see some snow showers mixing in. We're not expecting a great accumulation, but still it's late April. We're still seeing some snow showers mixing in. Back to the west and the Pacific Northwest, the highest elevations, the mountains uh, seeing some higher elevation snow. And we could see up to a foot in some spots into the Cascades, the Rockies, and then lower elevation rain, some valley rain as well. The southwest, you're going to be dry. That's the good news. Lots of sunshine. We're dry in the south for most of the day, at least southern plains, but we're going to see rain developing later. And then it's going to stay in place over the next few days. So we're looking at the chance for flash flooding. One spot that's going to see some heavy rain today, even the chance for strong to severe storms in parts of Florida. It's a area of uh, low pressure, a cold front that's kind of draped across the area. Northern New England, it's a cold and dreary day. It's a Monday and it's going to feel like a Monday there as we have an area of low pressure just kind of lingering there, very slow to move away. So let's talk about Florida first because we aren't seeing too much this morning. You're starting to see pockets of some heavier rain. That's where you see those brighter colors. But this will pick up as we go throughout the day, especially this afternoon into this evening. Could see some strong storms. Could see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour with any of these storms. Also some hail, a brief tornado tornado is possible and really heavy rain. This is on top of saturated ground because we've gotten so much rain in the past few months here. And we're looking anywhere from four, even up to six inches of rain in some spots. So Jupiter could see a lot. Where you see those brighter colors, again, that's correlating to the higher amounts of rain. So we're going to watch that closely as we go throughout the day. Further to the west and parts of the southern plains, we're watching for the chance for some flash flooding as well, especially Wichita, Dodge City, down to Oklahoma City, Ardmore also. Amarillo could see some flash flooding. That would be later on tonight. This slides to the east tomorrow, so then your slight risk is now where you see that darker blue, the marginal risk is in that lighter blue, Little Rock, Jop Joplin, Dallas could see some really heavy rain. That will last into Wednesday. Also watching the chance for some strong storms. So 10 million people at risk tomorrow with the risk for really large hail, two inches or higher. That causes damage on its own. Also, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. A few tornadoes are possible, so that's going to be one to watch. And then, of course, yeah, we mentioned the cold. It is cold with that area of high pressure just funneling down that cold air. So you'll need the jacket as you head later on today, too, Stephanie. Well, I want warm weather. Me too. This is right. when I, I say we need to move to Florida. Every yeah. year I say this. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Michelle, thank you very much. Sure. Coming up, we're less than two weeks away from the coronation of King Charles. And this morning, we're learning new information about Meghan Markle's decision not to attend the event. We have the latest as the UK makes the final preps for the big day. Next, you're watching Morning News Now. Britain's royal family has released a series of photos over the weekend marking what would have been Queen Elizabeth's 97th birthday. It comes as the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, dismisses reports she exchanged letters with King Charles over allegations of unconscious bias within the royal family. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Cobiea joins us from London with more. Kelly? Steph, good morning. Yeah, we know Prince Harry has RSVP'd that he is coming to the coronation in just 12 days' time, arguably the most important day of his father, King Charles's royal life. But Meghan is staying behind in California with the kids. And now a new article is suggesting that a rift between Meghan and King Charles could be the real reason. The royal family keeping busy as the king's coronation date closes in and scrutiny of Prince Harry's visit ramps up. This morning, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, visiting a child care center and giving a British TV host hints about what she'll wear. I said, I feel like you're going to wear blue. And she was like, there is a hint of blue. 
The royal family releasing birthday photos. This new picture of William and Kate's youngest son, Prince Louis, who turned five on Saturday. And on Friday, this picture of the Queen with some of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren at Balmoral Castle in Scotland on what would have been her 97th birthday. King Charles and Camilla, the Queen consort, spent the weekend at Queen Elizabeth's favorite retreat in Scotland, surprising the locals, a fan taking this video of the royal couple stepping out to visit a new restaurant. Though Prince Harry is set to join the rest of his family in less than two weeks, he and his wife Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, continuing to attract distracting headlines. Meghan, who is not attending the May 6th coronation, now publicly responding to an article that claimed after that bombshell Oprah interview two years ago, she had an exchange of letters with King Charles that left her unhappy about some of her allegations of unconscious bias in the royal family. A spokesperson for the Sussexes calling the story false and frankly ridiculous, saying in part, the Duchess of Sussex is going about her life, not thinking about correspondence from two years ago related to conversations from four years ago. And we encourage the tabloid media and various royal correspondents to stop the exhausting circus that they alone are creating. We asked Buckingham Palace about this latest reporting. They declined to comment. But it's interesting to note in that statement from the Sussexes that they didn't deny the existence of this back and forth of letters between King Charles and Meghan. They simply said it's not the reason the Duchess of Sussex is staying back in California, that she's staying there to be with the couple's two young children, uh, Princess Lilibet and Prince Archie, on May 6th, Coronation Day, and also, Steph, Prince Archie's fourth birthday. Oh, it's all exciting stuff, and of course, the drama <laughs> continues. Kelly, thank you so much. <laughs> More international news now. Global military spending has reached an all-time high, most of it because of the war in Ukraine. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us now with that and more. Good morning, Ali. Hi again, Steph. That's right. Russia's war in Ukraine has sparked a massive rise in global military budgets. In Europe, it's been the biggest annual increase in expenditure since the end of the Cold War three decades ago, according to a leading Swedish think tank. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute uh, estimated world military expenditure rose by 3.7% in 2022 to over $2.2 trillion. The U.S. has been the biggest donator of military aid to Ukraine, whose spending rose by a staggering 640% in 2022. Around 3,000 migrants are marching through southern Mexico in what they're calling a mass protest procession, demanding changes in the way they're treated and an end to the detention centers uh, like the one that caught fire last month, killing 40 migrants. Uh, the migrants started their protest in the city of Tapachula near the Guatemalan border with the aim of reaching Mexico City to make their voices heard. And finally, seagulls usually get a bad rap for their intrusive behavior, their droppings, and their constant raiding of rubbish bins. But a small coastal town in Belgium is trying to change their reputation by staging a seagull screaming contest uh, in order to get more sympathy for them because the organizers of the contest say they're part of the coastline and there wouldn't be a coastline without them. You can't help by feeling that by the end of the contest, the contestants are going to be more unpopular than the seagulls. Yeah, you know, Ali, I can't, I can't imagine spending time with those seagulls either, but uh, good for them, <laughs> spirit of competition. All right, Ali, thank you so much. Coming up, a former Minnesota police officer has been released from prison today after serving time in the deadly shooting of a black man. We'll tell you what's next for former officer Kim Potter and how the family of the victim, Dante Wright, is reacting to her release this morning. Plus, we're following the latest on actor Jamie Foxx, who's been in the hospital for several days. What we're learning about the medical incident that sent him there and his road to recovery.
We're back with some breaking news. Former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter was released from prison this morning after serving 16 months for fatally shooting 20-year-old black motorist Dante Wright. Police said Wright had an expired license plate when they pulled him over in 2021. Officers said he then ran from them when they discovered he had an outstanding warrant. Potter said she accidentally pulled her handgun instead of her taser when she shot Wright. Last year, she was found guilty of first and second degree manslaughter for fatally shooting Wright. Potter was sentenced to two years in prison. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch joins us now from Chicago with the details. Jesse, nice to see you. Good morning. What, what more can you tell us about Potter's release and what happens to her now that she's out? Yeah, good to be with you, Steph. So we got these details just a short time ago. Uh, we know now that Kim Potter was released at 4 a.m. Central Time. That's 5 a.m. Eastern. And we're told that during her supervised release, she will be spending that time in Wisconsin. Remember, obviously, this occurred and the trial was in Minnesota, uh, but she's going to be spending that supervised release in Wisconsin. We're told she has to report where she's living, what she's doing. She can uh, have unannounced visits from officials. She can be drug and alcohol tested, and she cannot possess a firearm. She cannot have a gun. They say she can't even be in the presence of a gun. Uh, that's what we got from the State Department of Corrections a short time ago. And again, obviously, this is a fluid situation. We were waiting to find out when she would be released. We knew it was expected today. We weren't given a specific time mm -hmm. because of safety concerns. And we now know that she has been released, according to the state. Uh, you know, Wright's death sparked days of protest in 2021. Were there any concerns over Potter's safety when she was released this morning? Absolutely. And that's what, part of the reason why officials say they did not give us a specific time ahead of time. Also, obviously, she was uh, released very early in the morning. Officials say that is because they were doing that for her safety as well as the safety of people at the prison. And officials have made a point of saying that they had uh, analysts, intelligence analysts that were reviewing material, trying to keep an eye on the situation in the run up to this release. And they say that there was concern. They came across threatening comments against Potter and there were concerns about violent protests being held outside of the prison uh, where she was being held. So there was concern over that and they took that into account when they made this decision. Let's talk about Wright's family. How did they respond back when Potter was sentenced? Was it enough for them? And have we heard from them at all about her being let go? Yeah, so first of all, uh, the family, when the sentence was announced, uh, was not happy with that decision. And the other piece of this is even though she was sentenced to uh, one thing, she's serving even less than what her actual sentence was, because in Minnesota, as officials explained it to us, people serve two thirds of their sentence in prison. The last third is on supervised release. There's no parole board. There's no time off given for good behavior, we're told. So whatever she got, she was only going to serve two thirds of that. That said, the sentence handed down uh, was something that the family of Dante Wright was not pleased with. Here's part of what we've heard from his brother, for example. Words from my parents is basically saying that uh, they just feel so hurt and overwhelmed with what was going on. Um, we felt more of a slap in the face than anything. We feel like there should have been more time handed out to Kim Potter in this case. Um, nothing that we can do can change the fact that, you know, Kim Potter murdered our brother. And again, Steph, at this point, she has been released from prison and served less than what she was actually sentenced because of the rules in the state of Minnesota, Steph. All right, Jesse, thank you for staying on top of it. We appreciate it. And now to an update on actor Jamie Foxx's condition. He spent nearly two weeks in the hospital recovering from an unspecified medical issue. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is following the story, and she has an update. Good morning, Blaine. Well, Steph, good morning to you. And that's right, you know, Fox's movie was set to shoot a car chase scene here in Atlanta on the morning that he was rushed to the hospital. Now, we don't know exactly what medical issue led to him needing treatment, but this morning, the well wishes and the prayers are rolling in. He's been one of Hollywood's brightest stars for decades. Now, this morning, an encouraging update on Academy Award winning actor Jamie Foxx, who has spent nearly two weeks in an Atlanta hospital. Multiple sources tell People magazine the star's condition is steadily improving. Fox was suddenly rushed to the hospital on April 11th while in Atlanta shooting for an upcoming movie. 
In a statement the next day, his daughter indicated he suffered a medical complication but did not elaborate further, writing on Instagram, due to quick action and great care, he is already on his way to recovery. The 55-year-old actor was filming for his upcoming Netflix movie, Back in Action, alongside Cameron Diaz in her first movie since 2014. Fox has been widely credited with convincing her to come out of retirement to do the movie. Fox even tweeted this light-hearted phone call last year. Oh my God, is this Tom Brady? I was talking to Jamie, and um, he said you need a few tips on how to unretire. This photo from the set, taken last week, shows an apparent body double standing in for Fox. For decades, Jamie Fox has shined in every corner of the red carpet. Well, I guess if you say so, I'll have to pack my things and go. Reaching the height of Hollywood success in 2005, when his portrayal of Ray Charles won him the Academy Award for Best Actor. But he's perhaps just as famous for his stellar singing voice. Now his fellow stars are flooding social media with support, coming together to wish Fox well. He's going to be stronger and better than ever. Now, Fox's team has not commented or given any updates on his condition. And filming didn't just happen here in Atlanta. He and Cameron Diaz were spotted in London in recent months shooting the movie as well. Steph. Well, it's nice to hear that he's doing better. Blaine, thank you so much. Longtime Dancing with the Stars judge Len Goodman has died following a long battle with bone cancer. He was 78. Best known for his sharp and insightful critiques of some of the most iconic routines, Goodman is now being remembered by family, friends, and fans alike. NBC News correspondent Chanel Jones takes a look at his life, both on and off the dance floor. Len Goodman. This morning, fans are celebrating the remarkable life of Len Goodman, the beloved Dancing with the Stars judge, who passed away over the weekend at age 78. Goodman's agent confirmed the news, saying that he had died at a hospice on Saturday peacefully, surrounded by his family. He had been suffering from bone cancer. Goodman served as the head judge on Dancing with the Stars for 17 years, shepherding the hit show since season one. What a fabulous way to start this off. I tell Back in November, he announced his retirement, saying he wanted to spend more time with his family back in Britain. I've been with the show since it started in 2005, and it has been a huge pleasure to be a part of such a wonderful show. The audience paying tribute with a standing ovation. Goodman began dancing as a young adult, winning the British championships in his late 20s. He was almost 60 years old, running a dance school, according to the BBC, when the call came to judge the popular British show Strictly Come Dancing in 2004. He rose to stardom in the U.S. with his longtime run on Strictly's U.S. adaptation, Dancing with the Stars. He was praised for his straightforward approach to giving feedback to contestants. He was also complimentary and kind. This morning, celebrities sending condolences via social media. Goodman's fellow judge, Bruno Tanioli, writing, I will treasure the memory of our incredible adventures and hundreds of shows we did together. We will miss you. Our thanks to Chanel Jones for that report. Coming up, there's a chance that one day the chicken you eat may not come from a farm. Yikes. But instead, a lab. We'll take you inside the project hoping to make that a reality and make sure you can't taste the difference. Plus, we're going underwater. In just a few minutes, we'll be joined by a scientist who's living underwater for 100 days. The important information he's hoping to learn from this project next. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Now to why a new kind of chicken could one day be coming to your dinner plate. More than 150 companies are working to make lab-grown meat and seafood a reality. NBC News correspondent Maya Eaglin has more. It's Big Tech's newest take on Big Ag. No farmland, no coops. But these labs in Silicon Valley could be the future of meat. There are a lot of benefits of making meat in this way, from 70% less emissions, 70% uh, less water and land. But one of the biggest is you don't need to harm an animal. 
Josh Tetrick is the CEO of Eat Just. It's one of only two companies in the U.S. that's received clearance from the FDA for human consumption of lab-grown meat. The USDA still needs to approve it for sale. This is not vegan or vegetarian. The other company is Upside Foods, headed by cardiologist Uma Valetti. Talk to me about the science here. How does it work? The science is fascinating, but it's fairly simple. We take cells from eggs or young animals or mature animals, and we identify the cells that are capable of going into fats, proteins, connective tissue. Those cells are then prepped in a lab and pumped into stainless steel vessels. Inside this bioreactor tank, there are billions of chicken cells growing. It'll take about a month before they're ready to eat. Right now in the U.S., you can only eat cultivated chicken on company premises. Definitely has the chew factor yeah. of chicken. Shreds like chicken, too. Yeah. It's soft in texture. I have to say, it, it very, 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 very close. On average, Americans eat 100 pounds of chicken a year. But raising livestock comes at a cost, contributing 14.5% of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, according to the UN. The companies making lab-cultivated meat say they can fix that, if they can bring down their costs. Currently, the only place in the world you can buy cultivated meat is in Singapore, where Eat Just sells its chicken at a financial loss. So if the motivation isn't profit here, why sell in Singapore? Selling in Singapore is a way of demonstrating that this new approach to making meat is not science fiction, but it's here. It's reality. Experts say lab-grown chicken showing up on store shelves in the U.S. is likely still years away. There's a ton of risk in doing this. There's a lot of uncertainty. But the other option is not to do anything, and that, that seems worse. Pushing for change one bite at a time. Maya Eaglin, NBC News, San Francisco. Some wild stuff there. Let's turn now to some financial headlines. Global investment bank Credit Suisse says it lost over $68 billion, that's billion with a B, in assets this past quarter. CNBC, Silvana Hanau joins us now with that and other news. That's a lot of money to lose, Silvana. It, really, it absolutely is. So listen to this. New information is coming out about Credit Suisse's very first quarter collapse before being rescued by rival UBS. The bank revealed that it suffered a net asset outflows of more than $60 billion, as you just mentioned. Now, Swiss authorities brokered the controversial $3 billion Swiss franc rescue in late March following a collapse in Credit Suisse deposits and share price amid fears of a global banking crisis triggered by the fall of U.S. lender Silicon Valley Bank. A new report out reveals that big spending on business trips might be a thing of the past. The Morning Consult study declared that business travel will never return to normal. Why? Well, experts blame tighter budgets and new ways of virtual working. The report also says the demographics are changing too. Business travelers are now younger and more likely to fly in economy class with about half earning less than $50,000 a year. And jury selection is underway for a trial over claims that British pop star Ed Sheeran owes a share of profits from his hit Thinking Out Loud for copying Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On. The lawsuit filed in 2017 has finally made it to a trial that is expected to last a week in a Manhattan federal courtroom. Sheeran is among the witnesses expected to testify. So we'll keep an eye out for that. All right, we certainly will. Thank you, Silvana. Sure thing. A biomedical engineer is taking a deep dive for the sake of science. His name is Dr. Joe Dituri. Dr. Dituri is also a retired saturation diver for the U.S. Navy, and he's currently living underwater for 100 days. Just the thought of it gives me the sweats. He's doing it living in a lodge 22 feet below the surface of a Florida lagoon, studying prolonged compression on the human body. And this feat is one for the record books. When it's all said and done, he will break the world record for the longest time spent underwater in a fixed environment. And Dr. Joe Dutori joins us now from his lodge, 22 feet underwater. Thank you so much for joining us, although my guess is that you're looking for things to do. Uh no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually really crazy busy with the science that we're doing, but I appreciate the reach out and the ability to uh, come on your show. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, I, I know you're going to break this record, but I also know that you, there's a real reason behind why you're doing this. Can you right. can explain it to us? 
So the current record is 73 days and we're staying 100 days. And the honest reason why I'm staying 100 days is because I can't stay 200 days. And 200 days is the distance to get from here to Mars. So we're testing and checking isolated, confined, extreme environment work here, uh, including muscle band testing, including uh, I'm doing electrocardiograms, electroencephalograms on myself. The entire time that I'm down here, I'm taking blood, urine, saliva, seeing what happens to the human body when you're in this state before we get in that that plane and go to Mars for a little while, right? So it's going to be one of those things that if we don't check it here on Earth, it's going to be problematic when we're trying to get to Mars. The second reason that I'm doing this is outreach, outreach to kids to get them involved in science, technology, engineering, and math, and see how cool it can be. You can do research in C2 or in the environment that you're in, and, and it can be fun and cool and interesting. And the third and final thing is I'm interviewing all of my friends that are down here, PhD MDs, we're talking about preservation, protection, and rejuvenation of the marine environment. We get 60 to 70 percent of our oxygen from the world's oceans, and we need to take care of them. So, right, but here's my question: When you're underwater, there's more pressure. When you yes. go into space, there's less. So, how are you learning about space travel if you're in compressed situation? Great, great, great uh, comeback. I understand that. So we're at 14.7 pounds per square inch on the International Space Station and probably as we go to Mars. We're at 25 pounds per square inch. So it's just opposite. We have to decompress to get into our U.S. spacesuit. We have to decompress to get out of here. So when you go in the U.S. spacesuit to go clean the windows on the spacecraft as you're going, you have to do decompression. But since the dawn of time, we have, you know, uh, dawn of space travel, if you will, we have trained astronauts in the ocean or in the in the pools so that they could get used to the zero gravity. And that's basically what we do. We get used to the zero G here. And as I say, it's, it's more of the isolated, confined, extreme environment stuff as opposed to the exactly analogous to space travel. It's kind of sort of analogous. Isolated, confined environments freak me out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in all, in all honesty, but I wonder, um, are, are you actually feeling any effects on your body right now? Uh, so, so everybody asks me this, and I kind of, I kind of have this little. It, there's an increased urinary output. Uh, that's the one thing that we've seen right now. <laughs> you're so peeing a lot. Frequent... Just say it. Yeah. Just say you're peeing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Frequency and urgency of urination is uh, is definitely up for sure. We think that's a pressure immersion diuresis thing, but the answer is nobody really knows yet. I'm, I'm working with, I have 10 medical doctors on this, two PhDs in psychology and one psychiatrist. We did 19 psychological psychosocial tests. So we're trying to really get the whole gamut of stuff before we come out of here. All right. Well, Dr. Joe DeTore, it was so fun to talk to you. Thank you so much. Good luck. We'll Thank be keeping you. an eye on it. Thank you All very right. much. Look forward to talking to you. All right. Coming up now uh, on Morning News Now, a comeback story with a Hollywood ending. Welsh soccer team Wrexham has made its way to the English Football League with the help of some Ryan Reynolds star power. We'll take you inside their Cinderella story next. Turning now to a fairy tale comeback story in the world of soccer. Over the weekend, Welsh team Wrexham was promoted to the English Football League after being crowned champions of the country's lowest tier, National League. The third oldest club in the world is famous for being part owned by Hollywood stars Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons has more on this remarkable win. Keir, I certainly hope the Wrexham fans are celebrating in the proportionate way we would expect them to. <laughs> exactly right. You know, it has put hope in the heart of so many uh, soccer fans, Steph, so many fans who stand around cold uh, football pitches like this weekend after weekend, hoping that someone like Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney would actually come and buy their club. And even if you struggle to pronounce McElhenney, then you know how to say goals, goals and more goals and let's all go down the pub. It's the underdog victory fit for Hollywood. Wales Wrexham Football Club promoted to the English Football League after 15 years of playing in the lowest professional soccer class. Saturday night's win punctuated by a wave of fans descending on the pitch. 
and a stream of tears from the team's famous owners, Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds, who FaceTimed his wife, Blake Lively, and their kids after the final whistle. Even fans in McElhenney's hometown of Philadelphia were cheering from across the pond. People said at the beginning, why Wrexham? Why Wrexham? This exactly why Wrexham. Happening right now is why. This North American invasion on Britain's soccer scene, a real life Ted Lasso tale. Expectations for us are as low as a rattlesnake's belly button, huh? <laughs> now it seems the world can believe in Wrexham. The comeback story started just two seasons ago when the actors decided to purchase the team, as documented in the FX docu-series, Welcome to Wrexham. The town reminds me of Philadelphia. Yeah. It's a working class town. I feel like I know those people. I grew up with those people. I am one of those people. Their celebrity ownership has made the 159-year-old club Hollywood's team, with some of their famous friends like Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd often seen cheering on the Red Dragons. After the championship win, McElhenney and Reynolds seen soaking in every moment. After New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say no to the owner, can I? Are you putting that on eBay, Ryan, or what's going on? Listen, I work in show business, we fall on hard times. <laughs> the guaranteed promotion will likely bring the team more fans, exposure, and of course, money. It literally drives an entire community, and that's what football does over in the UK. And these are this huge windfall for, the, for these football clubs. Steph, Ryan Reynolds just tweeted to describe soccer as one of the most romantic things on earth, which is one of the most on-point things I've heard to come across from that side of the pond in many, many years. Real quick, uh, Steph, my side is called Charlton Athletic. It's in south-east London. We're kind of looking for a new owner, so if anyone in Hollywood is watching, cool, call me. Kier, forget Hollywood. What about me? How about, how about you and me? You'll have to continue hey, to call it soccer, though. I'll done. insist. <laughs> I do All that. Right. Yes, let's talk, let's talk. OK. All right, Kier, thank you so much. We end this hour with a behind-the-scenes look at one of New York's most iconic restaurants, Carbone New York. Co-owner and chef Mario Carbone opened his doors for a rare interview with Today co-host Carson Daly. Take a peek at the magic cooked up in this kitchen. We are in Greenwich Village, and we're going to see the Pope of Greenwich Village food. That is Mario Carbone. We're going to sit, we're going to talk, we're going to cook. It's like a time portal when you walk through this door. I can hear Sinatra already. Come on in. It feels like a movie in here, and I feel like I'm immediately transported into a scene of Goodfellas. That was the whole idea. How do I take basically Ray Liotta's 42nd scene in the back of Copacabana? Yeah. From when, when they open the front door, they get hit with the music, right. they smell the food. The waiters are coming by. The waiters are coming by. You wanted to take that vision and make a cinematic experience. It's a lot more than just the food. So you can witness the, the woolly mammoth that was the Italian-American in 1958. Chef Mario Carbone opened his celebrity hotspot 10 years ago. Now, it's nearly impossible for mere mortals to get a reservation. There's this whole celebrity factor in here. Jay-Z sitting in the corner any given night. But there's a million Italian restaurants right even around here. What makes Carbone stand out so much? We buy the absolute best ingredients. We try really, really hard to give you dinner as the show every night. You've created a home. Like, the Italian table is home for everybody. Mario's vision comes from his upbringing, raised in a traditional Italian-American family in Queens, surrounded by home-cooked food. Who was cooking for you growing up? My mom cooked every night. She's a fantastic cook. Her parents were born in Italy, so I would be with them and invariably in the kitchen where they were cooking all day long. I was always in the mix. Carbone's magic has spread to Miami with a restaurant and star-studded pop-up called Carbone Beach. It's an over-the-top Carbone meal that takes what we do at Carbone and just amplifies it. It's Frank of the Copa in the 60s. You sound like the Martin Scorsese of food. <laughs> Ricky Tonelli is Carbone's day-to-day -day face, a larger-than-life personality. Ricky takes care of everybody. Can America meet Ricky? My AKA daughter. the face. How long have you been here, Ricky? Since day one, yeah. Can you whip up a little something, something? You know, we'll bring out a couple of classics. How's that? 
Carbone classics like spicy rigatoni. Oh, come on, Ricky. The world famous spicy rigatoni. Beautiful. Beautiful. There you go. Look at that. Buon appetito. Grazie. That was delicious. You sausage. get the sausage, right? Get, of course, you get the bite of it. With the tortellini, there's a pinch point. You have to pinch them together. All right, let's learn how to cook it. Let's do it. You are going to get a special pass today. At the Carbone Kitchen, where a few people can say they've been and actually cooked in. About to rock it. All right, chef, what's the first step to the tortellini? OK, first step we've already done for you, which is Thank baking. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Making the dough. Sheet it super, super thin. These are the things that people at home can make. They can make a touch of carbone by making this. 100%. Here's our filling. Two different ricottas. This is sheep's milk and cow's milk. Salt, pepper, thyme, nutmeg. Put a little dollop here. Drop of water to adhere it. And then you're going to pick it up, roll into a half moon, give it a little pinch. Bring the two ends together here. This art, I mean, they're so thin, it's crazy. Just right in the water. Right in the water. How come you don't ask Siri to set a timer like I do at home? <laughs> and then the sauce is just melted butter and water. This is our Sunday sauce, bolognese. Same mix as the meatballs. That's one order. I think a couple of these are mine. How, how, do, how do they look to you, Yeah, chef? I think maybe that one. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell. Uh, the one that's like, uh. That is literally the perfect bite of food. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, my God. I got to go eat some tortellini. <laughs> Thanks to Carson Daly for that report. Carbone Beach kicks off May 4th through the 7th. That does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.